Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem and welcome back. Today's Daf is Ksuba Yismem Dalad and we are holding at the third line from the top of the Amid Amar Mar. Let's pick up where we left off yesterday. This fellow wrote two Ksubais for his wife. He writes one Ksuba which contains a standard commitment 200 Zuz dated Echad Be Nisan. Then he follows with another Ksuba containing a commitment for 300 Zuz. So you added a third. The thing is that this document is dated uh, a month later. So what does uh, Rav Huna tell us? She can pick and choose. It's up to her which star she wishes to, wishes to use. She can use the first star with the 200 Zuz, but there's an advantage there because it's from the earlier date. Or she can choose to use a later star. Contains a higher amount. It went up to 300, but it is bound by the later date. Now, you may ask, what effect does the date written in the star have on the collection of that, of that debt? The answer is, because the date recorded in a document is the uh, effective start date of the lien imposed on this fellow's properties, in which case the claimant can collect any properties which he may have sold after that effective lien date had begun. So here she has a choice. She can go ahead and tap into the first star, although it has a disadvantage. It's a lower amount, but it has an advantage. It's dated earlier, which allows her to collect any properties which he may have sold off after that early date. Or she can choose to go with the second star. Higher amount, but a later date. So according to Rav Huna, both documents, in this case, uh, they're Aksubais, they're perfectly valid. It's not that one negates the other. They're both fine. You can only use one of them. Pick and choose which one you want. It's a package deal. Each one has a, a mala and a chasern, an advantage and a disadvantage. Go with other, whichever one suits you best. So that's Rav Huna's halacha. So the Gemara will refer back to this halacha and elaborate on it. Amar Mar, let's go back and review. There are two ksubais. Which one may she use? Either one. Iboya. If she chooses, Baha'i Gavya. She can collect using one ksuba. Viboya. If she chooses, Baha'i Gavya. She can use the other one for collection. Leima Pliga the Rav Nachman. Apparently, Rav Huna's halacha is in dispute with Rav Nachman. The Amr Rav Nachman is Hayoitzim Bezeacharzeh. If there are two documents, one after the other, on the same property, Reuven sold Shimon this field today. There's another document. Reuven sold Shimon the same field the next day. Bitail is Shani Yasarishan. The second star is, in effect, nullifying the first star. You can't have two stories describing the same transaction. Apparently, the second one is the valid one, which undoes the first one. Whether we're speaking about two sales, two g- gift letters. And here, Rafuna says, it's up to her which one she wants to use. The answer is, love me itmar Allah. Haven't we learned a pshat on Rav Nachman? Um, Rav Papa. It all depends on the situation. Um, Rav Nachman. Even Rav Nachman, who maintains that star 2 nullifies star 1, he would agree in the following case. If there's a difference in terms of content, in terms of packaging the transaction. Suppose he added another component, another element. He added more content. In the second star. In the second star, he added another palm tree and included it in the sale. Litai Sephis Kasve. 
In which case, it indicates to us that the purpose of the second document was not to clash with the first one, rather to add. To add that palm tree. So just a marshal. It means to say that there's some sort of addition in terms of content or otherwise in the second star. That's the reason why he wrote it. But the first star is still fine. It's up to him. He wants to use the first star without the palm tree. Okay. He'll miss the palm tree, but he has the earlier date. Or he can choose to use the second star. The later date, but it has the palm tree. Likewise by us. The husband added another hundred over the first star, which only had two hundred. That's why he wrote another one. For three hundred. It's a high sofa. It's an addition. He's trying to supplement. So now she has a choice. She can choose to go with the earlier date, if that suits her better, and end up with 200, or go with the second star, which gives her 300 from the later date. Gufa, let's go back to Omar of Nachman. Shnei stories. Hayyotim Bezecharzeh. You have two documents written one after the other, describing the same exact deal, detail, Shani Sarishin. Number two nullifies number one. Amar Papa. So the Gemara already referred to this Rav Papa before. Now we're going to proceed in greater detail. Amar Papa. Moider Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman would agree. The Aisebe Dikla. If he added a palm tree in the second star, which was not present in the first star, that was the reason why he wrote the second star, but not to undo the first star. And the Gemara explains further. What about the following case? That's Pashat, Pshita, it's obvious. Then in the next two cases, we view the second star as trying to supplement the first star because there's an additional component in number two not present in number one. Pshita, Rishon Vemecher. The first document records a sale. This field was sold to Shimon. Vesheni Vematana. Come the second document, we find it described as a, as a gift being given to Shimon. Certainly in this case we say the reason why he wrote the second document was to grant additional powers and privileges to Shimon above and beyond the powers that he received through the first star, the bill of sale. What additional powers would he receive through the second star which describes it as as a gift. Mishamdino de Bar Metra. He can avoid the Bar Metra claim. Bar Metra means a neighbor. So typically, a neighbor has the ability to step forth and he has first refusal rights. That's what they call it today. So when Reuben sells property to Shimon, a fellow who owns the neighboring property has first rights. It makes it easier for him to attend to two properties if they're next to each other, etc. So he has rights. Din of the bar mitzvah, the din of the neighbor. To get priority. Access to that property, right? But that's only by a sale. Because it's based on the Pasuk, which says, V'asisa ha-yashar Hashem implores us to do what's right. Do what's gracious. Asisa hayasher v'hatoiv. You're selling it anyways. You're out to make the money. Why don't you sell it to the neighbor? Who can benefit from this sale? More than that stranger who's just coming in here from nowhere. That only applies to a mecher. I'm selling it. May as well sell it to him. But I'm a ton. I want to give it as a gift to him. He's my good friend. The bar mitzvah has no claim. So that's why he added another star. First he sold it. By a sale, a bar mitzvah can interfere. So he added the star matana to sort of turn it into a gift. I'm giving it to him as a gift. In which case, the neighbor can have no complaints. It's almost like, if you'll complain, I'll really turn it into a gift. I'll, take, I'll give him back his money. So that's why he presented him with another star. 
to give him that option. That's all. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to undo, he wasn't trying to negate the sale. He was just trying to add and to empower the recipient of that field. That's a Tesefis. And therefore, both documents can stand. The Kolshkin certainly says the Gemara, if it's in the reverse. Rishon v'matona v'sheni v'mechaf, the first document recorded a, a gift. V'sheni v'mechaf, and the second described it as a sale. Of course, in this case, we understand why he upgraded it to a sale. Da'amrinan v'shom dina d'bal chayv, who the cause of Cain, we understand. He turned it into a sale so that the recipient can now have a, a lien on the seller's property. Say the, the field uh, will be snatched by a, a creditor of the seller. So the fact that he now has a document to show to prove that he purchased it, he can now go back and lay claim on the seller's properties after the creditor of the seller took away his property. That only works by a sale. But if I give you a gift, you can't have any complaints if somebody comes and takes it away. It's not a guaranteed transaction. So we understand why he added the Shtar Mechar after having written the Shtar Matana. That's a Tesefis. It adds empowerment and adds privileges. So in these two cases, where Shtar number two upgraded the recipients, Zuchus, We don't say star two negates star one. The point was to give him the additional schus if he chooses to use that star. Or he can choose to use, to use the first star. If that suits him better. So in both cases, Rav Nachman would agree. Both stories, both documents stand tall and are valid. El rather. But, ish name b'mecher. If both documents describe the transaction as a sale, Star 1 speaks about this field being sold to Shimon, and Star 2 does the same exact thing. Or Shneim B'matonav. Both describe the transaction as a gift. It's a redundancy. And therefore, Bitel is Shenius Arishen. The second star is ultimately negating and nullifying the first star, and he can only claim based on the second star and the date recorded within. My time up. Why would the second star be Mavatal, the first star? We have two reasons. Raphram Amar, he explained like this. Amar, we assume, We take it as a, a concession, as though Shimon, the recipient of that second star, why, why is he taking another star? He's conceding. He's being made that star number one it was worthless. It was with a forged star. By the very fact that Shimon is insisting and receiving another star on that same property, describing the same exact transaction as recorded in the first star, indicates that the first star is worthless. It's a forged star. The signatories in the uh, first star are worthless. The liars. Ravacha Omar, he explains, Amar, because we assume Achuli Achli. He was Michael, Le Shibudei. He was Michael, his claim. Although it was my field from day one. Through that first transaction described in that first star. I'm not denying the validity of that star describing that transaction, but I'm Michael. By way of accepting a new star with a later date, I'm in effect relinquishing, so to speak, my claim, not my ownership, my claims. And my claims will only commence starting from the date in this star. So let's say, um, in terms of the lien on the seller's properties, it only starts effective from today. I'm giving up all claims until today. Why would he do that? Maybe the, the seller asked him for a favor. He has an interest in... Uh, the buyer relinquishing, you know, uh, claims until today. Or maybe, as the rush says, the, the buyer got wind of the fact that the seller had 
had declared, had made a hida, moida it's called, before the actual sale, that whatever I do is null and void. So he wants to circumvent all those things. He says, yeah, let's start fresh. Let's make a new start from today. But technically, he was the owner from the time written in the first time. Might be now any difference between this shot and that shot, whether the reason for star number two negating star number one is because he's being moited that star number one is worthless, or is it because he's just giving up? He's willingly, so to speak, giving up his his shibud, his claims until today. Might be now. It could be now the three differences. Number one, arui sahati. What is the status of the of the Adam who signed that first star? Do we view them as men of integrity and we can trust them going forward and other testimonies that they might present? Or do we say, no, look, this fellow admitted that they are liars. They were involved in a forged document, in which case we can't trust them any longer. As Tesis explains, says Tesis was speaking that at least he, the, the recipient, who's conceding, he shouldn't be using those Adam, who according to his account are falsifiers. So that's if you work with Ram, Raphram's approach. That we view the second star and his involvement in the second star as a hida, a concession, as per the false, falsehood of the first star. Falseness of the first star. But according to Rav Acha's Pshat, he never meant to say as much. I was just willingly giving up. I was being Michael the Sheba. The first star is a perfect star. The Edom are perfectly fine Edom. That's one of Kamina. Urushlum is Peri. Suppose he had some Paris between these two periods, between when the star was written and then the second star, between the first and second star. So he consumed the Paris in the field. Does he have to repay for that? Well, according to Rath from yes. Because his acceptance of a second star is, a tantamount, is tantamount to concession that the field didn't, believe, didn't belong to him until now. So you have to pay up. Whereas according to Rav Acha, of course it belonged to me. I was just Michael on my claim until today. Number three, Ula Taska. Who pays the property taxes? According to Raphram, well, it turns out that it belonged to the seller until today. He pays. According to Rav Acha, the buyer pays because he was the owner from day one. And the Ru'a points out, he has a kasha, just because I admit that it was yours until now, you have to pay taxes? My haida could obligate you? So he says, yeah, because the taxes are paid by the one who has the fruit, who consumes the produce. And if it turns out that my agreement, my concession, my haida allows you to um, claim repayment for all the produce that I produced, I consumed until today, then you have to pay the property taxes as well. It's a package deal. It goes hand in hand. So bottom line is, when dealing with a double star, star written today, another star tomorrow, regarding the same uh, you know, event, same transaction, how do we deal with it? So pretty much we have three levels, three cases. If you know, he'll actually write into the second star that I'm trying to add such and such over the first star. Tesis points this out, and this is based on the Gemara that we learned yesterday. And then, of course, there's no uh, clash at all. Within the second star, there is reference to the first star being valid, so it's fine. But, there is no such uh, indication in the second star. But there is a Hesafa. He added a palm tree. He gave him extra powers. He made him into a, a matana instead of just a mecha or the other way around. So in that case, both documents are valid. You have a choice. You can use whichever one suits you better. But if both stars are in the same plane and describing the same exact transaction, now we have a collision. Rav Nachman tells us, star number two undoes star number one. Why? For one of two reasons. Either it's a hida that star number one is false, or he's relinquishing, he's giving up, he's being meichel on the Shiba until today. 
My Haviela de Ksuba. Let's go back to the Ksuba. A similar question we had yesterday. Not exactly two Ksubas. Rather a conventional case. He engages in Isha. The engagement activates the Chiv Ksuba. But then, only before marriage, do they actually sit down and write the Ksuba and put it into you know, formal form. So the question was, when does her claim begin? When does her lien start? Which would allow it to collect any properties that the husband may have sold after her lien commenced. Does it start from the moment of Ederson, when he becomes Chayiv, or it only starts when he actually sits down to write the Ksuba and it becomes formalized? My Havila, the Ksuba, what's the conclusion regarding the Ksuba? Tashma, the Amar of Yehuda, Amar Shmo, Meshom, Belazar, Rav Shimon. Mon umasayim, mena erisin, the basic amount, the hundred for the bu'ula, the two hundred for the basula, that's claimed from the moment of erisin, from engagement. But the sefes, mena nasum, but the added amount, which your husband typically adds over the base amount, that uh, was only activated when he actually wrote the, the uh, ksuba at the point of marriage. So her claim, as per that amount, relates to nasun. That's one shita. They disagree. Whether the base amount or the additional amount, it's activated at Nisun, so she pretty much like, sort of gives up any claims that she has until then, because that's when it gets formalized. And that's the Aloha Lamaisa. It starts from Nisun. So, the bottom line is we have two Shtaras or two Ksubais. They're both equal, both describing the same thing. She collects from the date of the Shani. Why? Because we assume the first one is forged, or he was Michael, the Shibud, as per the first one. If in the second one there's some additional information, some additional content or empowerment, then the fellow has a choice. He can collect using the first one or the second one. Certainly if he added the words Voicephus, that I'm sort of just adding over the first one, then you can use both of them. It's not either or. You can use both of them. You can use the first star for the amount written in the first star, and then you could use the second star for the supplemental amount. Regarding when does the Shibud begin, is it Erison or Nisun? The is, it starts from Nisun. Continues the mission. Hagi Erison is Gaira Bita Ima. We have an older woman who converted, and she brings along her small young daughter. Even if she's below three years old, in which case she's presumed to be a besula. Vizinza, she gets involved in inappropriate behavior while she's a nara and engaged. Typically, the oinish for that is skila, death by stoning. But since she was not born Jewish, in this case, we give her a different type of misa, harizuba chenek, by way of choking. Now, we know there's a parsha on the Torah called Maitzi Shamra. This fellow claims that he discovered his wife to be an Ambasula after marriage. So one of two things may have happened. Adam come and say, yeah, she was involved in Znus during engagement. In which case, she is severely punished with Skila, which takes place at the doorstep of her father's home. Look, uh, look how you raised your daughter, etc., etc. If it turns out that he's trumping up the charges, it's all fabricated, then he's in the wrong and he's punished. He has to pay a fine, a hundred kesef. He gets a malchus, he has to marry her, stay married to her. But all these halachas typically apply strictly to a case where she's a full-fledged Israelis, conceived and born Jewish. If that's not the case, then perhaps some or all of these details will not apply. As the mission will explain. Ein lo le pesach so now we're referring to Geiris, who was born before Geiris. So in this case, if it turns out that she committed znus during engagement, ain't no le pesach So it's just like she doesn't get skila, she gets chenek, it will not take place at the door, at the entranceway to her father's home. Because uh, technically she doesn't even have a father. Her Geisha father doesn't really identify with her. nor Will the mea sell a fine applied to him if it turns out that he is making it all up? 
the, the husband that is. So that's the first case. A giyaris, in her case, none of these halachas apply. Let's say she was conceived before her mother converted. But she was born Jewish, and she goes up a notch. It turns out that she committed no storing engagement. Harizub is skila, she gets skila. But of course, again, there is no father's doorway because she doesn't relate to her father who conceived her when she was not Jewish. If it turns out that the husband is the one fabricating the charges, he won't be fined a hundred sela. Oh, she was conceived and born Jewish. She's a full fledged Israelis. We treat her like a regular member of the community. She gets skila. If she was an Aramu Rasu Diznus, Yeshla. Oh, now, let's say she's a regular Bas Yisro. And Yeshla, ah, and she has a father. Father's around, but he doesn't own a home. He lives on a boat. There's no doorway to his house. Or Yeshla Pesach Besa'av. There's a doorway, but there's no father around. He passed away. Still, we move on with the Skila. Harezu Beskila. Why they never Pesach Besa'avia? El Mitzvah. Typically, you try to do it at the Pesach Besa'av, but it's only a Mitzvah which does not hold back the Skila. So we have three levels in the Mishnah. A regular Israelis, all Dinim apply. She's in the wrong, she gets Skila. He's in the wrong, he gets punished. If she's a Giyayres, born non Jewish, none of these halachas apply. Not on her side, not on his side. But if it's somewhere in the middle, conceived non Jewish, but born Jewish, we include her somewhat, pertaining to the halachas applying to her. If she's in the wrong, she gets skill. But pertaining to the halachas applying to him, if he's in the wrong, getting the Malkus and the Mea Kesav, that doesn't apply. That only applies if he schemed against a regular Bas Yisrael, but not in this case. But, how do we know that the skila would apply to her in this case? How do we know this is true? And Taisa says, what do you mean? It says be Israel. Why would you create that middle category? In which case you somewhat apply some of the halachas. She wasn't conceived and born Jewish. None of the halachas should apply. Amr Ishlakish, the Makrad, the Pasuk says, Umesa. Pasuk says they stone her and Umesa and she dies. Mesa is an extra word. The rabbis to include this middle case, although she was conceived non Jewish, but since she was born Jewish, the halach of skila applies. If that's the case, treat her like an ordinary basi stroll. Milk, anami milky. Milky. If her husband turns out to be in the wrong, let him get malchus. Let him pay up the hundred sela. Amakra umesa. The Pasuk that taught us the skila was the word Umesa, which teaches us Lumisa and Nisrapsi. She's included regarding the Misa aspect of this process, for legal knas, but not to the knas aspect of the process. So we include the Isha who was Leidasa Bekdusha, even though she was not conceived Jewish. Asks the Gemara, once you have a Ribui, let's go a step further. Let's go to the other case, the other extreme. Ve'emala Rabbi Seirasa Leidasa Bekdusha. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Who says, just the opposite. Who said that the Pasuk will include this middle case? Maybe the Pasuk is coming to speak about a case where her mother converted, but then conceived and bore the child, be Kedusha. But let's say she was conceived non-Jewish, it wouldn't apply. How do you know to include that case? Well, Ahi, a case where she was conceived and born Jewish, the Israelis, Mal Yusahi, she's a full-fledged Israelis, there's no need to discuss that. Rather, the Torah is adding a case where she was conceived non-Jewish, but since she was born Jewish, that is sufficient. Well, once you're including, let's include all the way. How do you know to stop there? Maybe we'll include the Isha, who was conceived and also born non-Jewish and then converted. And you can't be Israel, my honey, lay, if that were the case. Why would the Pasuk say be Yisrael? To indicate that you need to relate to Yisrael. Something had to be uh, Yisrael, either the Hayrasa and Leidasa, or at least Leidasa. But if none happened, if she was conceived and born 
Shaloi Bigdusha, of course, none of these halachas would apply. So bottom line is we have three levels. Conceived and born Jewish, full-fledged Israelis. Conceived and born prior to conversion, none of these halachas apply. Conceived non-Jewish and born Jewish, part of the process applies. If she's in the wrong, she gets skila, like a Bas Yisrael. But if he's in the wrong, there is no penalty process applied. <coughs> Suppose his wife doesn't have a father. He married a Israelis, no father. He's Maitzi Shemra. He spreads these uh, malicious rumors. The process of Maitzi Shemra does not apply. Why? When the Pasuk describes handing over the fine, who does he hand it over to? The father of the Nara. Prat in la'av, as opposed to this girl who has no father, where well, the process doesn't apply. Masiv Rabbi Yisib bar Abin, v'yitema some say Rabbi Yisib bar Zvida. The pasuk says v'yimayin yimayin avia. This is by the by the Aynes. Sorry, by the Mafate. So he's meant to marry her, unless she or her father object. La Rabbi Yisib soyme leknas, divay Rabbi Yisib glili. So according to Rabbi Yisaglili, the Pasuk is alluding to a case where there's no father. The Pasuk is saying, We learn that father can object, or if there's no father, she's an orphan, she can object. Apparently, the concept of knas applies even when there's no father, although the Pasuk did say, hand over the money to the father. Yeah, when there is a father. But it's not a prerequisite which would hold up the process. So according to Rabbi Yisrael here as well, by Maitzi Shemra, we have the Pasuk, hand the money over to the father. For, fine, when there's a father, but otherwise, the process still proceeds. So even a Yusayma would have this process. That's a kash. on Rabbi Yisrael who says a Yusayma doesn't have the whole process. Who Moisevla, who Mepharakla, so the same person who asked the kash turned around and gave an answer. The solution is like this. When the Bryce speaks about a girl without a father, we're speaking that the incident took place when he was around. And then she lost him. And since at the point of incident there was a father, that is enough. So according to this shita, no father, no imotzi shemra. Rav amachayev. Rabbi disagrees. Even without a father, the process continues. The penalties apply. Mimai, how does Rabbi know this? Midatani Ami, based on a brisa presented by Ami. Pasuk says, "Well, this fellow who uh, fabricated this uh, story about the Bas Yisro has to pay up. Why? Because he was Moitzi Shemra al Besul Yisro. Why does the pasuk have to say Besul Yisro?" as opposed to if she's a ger. Now, so the Pasuk is saying, if she's a geyeris, we don't apply the process. Now, this works well. If we should encounter a similar circumstance by a bas a circumstance which mirrors a ger, It would be Chayev. What is he saying? Basically, what he's saying is like this. A girl who is a ger is really tantamount to a Yisayma. She's an orphan. For all practical purposes, she has no father. No halakh father, Rashi explains. She no longer identifies or relates or associates with her non-Jewish father. In the Torah, we consider them to be totally separate entities. So for all practical purposes, she's a Yisayma. So if you tell me that typically by Yisrael, by Yisrael, a Yisayma is Chayiv and Maitzi Shemra, that explains the Pasuk, Hainu de Itzrich Krolem Okay, that's what the Pasuk has to say. Although a Bas Yisrael, who is a Yisayma, has Maitzi Shemra, but uh, by a Ger we don't apply it, as we explained in the mission. Eli, Amras be Yisrael, Kagavna Pata. But if you should tell me that by a Yisrael girl, there's no father, there's no Maitzi Shemra. 
then why do, why do we need the Pasuk to exempt a Ger? Hash to be Yisrael Pot. If you tell me that even by Yisrael without a father, he's Pot of a Ger, and everybody doesn't need to speak about a Ger being Potter? Of course there's no Chiv. Not only doesn't she have a father, she's even a Ger. There's no need to speak about it. Now the biggest proof that there is Maitzi Shemra even by a Yisraelma, provided that she's Yisrael. Amir Shlokish. Ha Maitzi Shemra Laktana Potter. This fellow schemed against his wife who was just a Ktana. Turns out that he's in the wrong. There's no penalty. Why? Shenemar v'nasnu l'avianara. He hands over the fine to the father of the Nara. And if we take a look at the spelling of the word Nara, Nara male dibra kasev. Terry adds the hey at the end to indicate she must be a real Nara past bas mitzvah, but a Ktana would not qualify. Maske flor of achabar av. Why do you need the special diyak of the hey? That's only because of the word hanara, which indicates that she's a nara. But otherwise, if not for this diyak, I would say, even a ktana would qualify? That's impossible. Haksiv, the Pasuk, speaks about her being found in the wrong. She committed an inappropriate act. What happens? We give a skill. That can't be speaking about a ktana who's not responsible for her actions. Has, uh, turns out that the story was true. She didn't have psalm, she engaged in this. They take the Nara to the entranceway of her father's home. And they apply skill. That can't be a Ktana. A Ktana doesn't have responsibility for her actions. Even without the Diak of Nara, it's obvious that she's not a Ktana. Ella, rather, Rishlakish meant like this. That a Maitishema must be a Gedola that's obvious. Kan Naaro. And that's exactly why the, the Pasuk spells it in full. Naaro with a He. To indicate here by Maitishema, where she is a Gedola. That's why she's called a Naaro. And this is meant to teach you. Ha kal makim shenemar Naar. Apparently elsewhere in the Torah. Where it says Nara with Arahe, Afilu Ktana Bamashma. That's coming to include even Ektana. Nara with Arahe is Ekdoila, like by Matsi Shamra, but it must be Ekdoila, otherwise it wouldn't be any skill. But otherwise, if it's Nara with Arahe at the end, Kamakam Shinema Nara with Arahe, like by Knas. Of Oynes, Afilu Ktana Bamashma, even Ektana is included in that Shitas Chachamim. Unlike Shita's Rav Meir, who holds it has to be a Nara by Knas as well. That was Rish Lakish's point. Okay, let's uh, summarize today's daf. We started with the sugi of the two stories, or the two ksuba, so sort of clashing with each other. If they're both identical, then you use the second one. The first one was either forged, or he gave up the rights regarding the first one. He adds some, you know, extra component in the second one, unpresent in the first one. That explains why he wrote the second one. Not to undo the first one, but to add. And therefore you have a choice. You can use either the first one from that earlier date or choose to use the second one from the later date. Certainly if you actually indicated in the second star that it was supplementing the first star, in that case, you're even better. You don't have to choose one over the other. You can use both stories. You can take the first star and collect with it based on the first date. And the supplement indicated in the second star, you can collect that as well based on this second date. At what point, at what point does her lien get applied to her husband's properties? Is it Erison? Is it Nesun? Allah is it starts from Nesun. A mighty Shemra, a fellow who claims that his wife was engaged in inappropriateness during their engagement period, what happens there? If it turns out that she is in the wrong, she gets skila al pesach beisavio. If she's a nara, nara murasa. It turns out that he's in the wrong. He has punished severely as well. Mea sela malka. He has to marry her. We have three cases. A giyaris. None of these halachas apply. If she was born Jewish, in that case, the skila element applies, but the other elements don't. Harasa vile dasa bekdusha. A full-fledged Israel who qualifies for the entire process.
regarding a Yisoyma, by Tzishamar Yisoyma, we have a Machlekes, and by Ektana, certainly, there is no process applied. All the best to you and much atzlacha.